even ordinary people will sometimes be brought up onto the cart and they're allowed to embrace Balaram or, or, or Jagannath. So it's very much uh, the case that Prabhupada, as it happened in Vrindavan, was bringing the Lord of the universe out beyond the wildest expectations. I mean, even the people of Jagannath Puri who acknowledge this is his day to come out and give association with the people couldn't imagine that he would appear on the other side of the ocean giving darshan to people who didn't even know what it, what it was about. And as you can see in the film, there were so many people came, so many common people from all over San Francisco used to gather in those days. And just wondering, probably just wondering how this is all happening to me. <laughs> why, why this is happening? So unassuming. Why me? I don't know, but I have to honor it. It's happening. That was his his mood, his whole mood of, of the Western success, celebrating the mission of Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Thakur taking hold unexpectedly in this foreign land. Sridhar Marsh once told us that Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Thakur on more than one occasion expressed a desire to spend a, a decade in America preaching. This was before America became the prominent country in the world, before World War II, when England was still the prominent country. Therefore, he sent an emissary to, to England. But he had, apparently, a vision that America would become the most dominant country in the world, and he had a desire for going and spending 10 years to preach in America. After telling us that, Jiddamar said, and through Swami Maharaj, your Prabhupada, he got 10 years plus two. Twelve years, I consider Bhakti Sarasvati Thakur lived in him. What could be a greater tribute <laughs> to how well one has served their guru than that? Srila Prabhupada sat on Subhadra's cart, and so I walked beside that cart because I wanted to have Srila Prabhupada's darshan as much as possible. And uh, he was so happy and radiant. And partway along the route, he raised up his hand and stopped the procession for a short time. And thousands of people stopped just because Srila Prabhupada raised his right hand. Prabhupada, at a certain point, uh, indicated that he had to go relieve himself. And so they simply stopped the cart and he got down and began to walk into the forest. Which, of course, in India, that's what anyone would do. And so. The devotees thought it was some kind of ceremony, so they all started following him. Like dozens of devotees started marching, and probably just laughed, turned around, and laughed, and held his hands and said, "No, you all stay here." And then, when he was ready to go again, he he made a, a gesture with his right hand, like onward, forward, and all of a sudden, all the carts started moving again. Thousands of people just started moving. It was so wonderful. It was it was the most wonderful feeling to be just anywhere near Srila Prabhupada. My friend Vatsara, he came to visit me in San Francisco and uh, we started going to different spiritual communities. By this time I had kind of accepted this spiritual master, Swami Satchitananda. I didn't really know that much about him, but I, I read Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita and I said, geez, I need, I need a spiritual master. But I didn't really think of the author of that Bhagavad Gita, you know, Prabhupada. That the old one, you know, the blue Vishnu on the cover. So anyway, we went to this group and that group. And uh, he said, well, let's go to the Hare Krishnas. And I said, oh, I've been there because I had been there for a Sunday feast. And guy was kind of a yogi and this and that. And the devotees are running around here and there. I said, yeah, it's a little bit. He's running around too much for me. So, so you go ahead. So he went. And uh, he spent the whole day there. And he came back and he talked about, God, I, I went there, I met this guy, the garbage man. You know, <laughs> he was just so far out. He told me all this stuff and he was just going on and on and on. And it turns out that that was Jayananda. He spent the whole day with Jayananda, you know, emptying the garbage and going here and going there. So he said, uh, they're having, you know, another program in the evening. And so uh, I said, okay, I'll go with you. So we went, and that was it. You know, the next day, we went out and bought cloth for dhotis and cloth for saris and beads and 
and by the time we, we got back home, we had decided we were going to shave up. And so we shaved up, we shaved up the kids, and, and, and we showed up at the temple the next day. And oh, the boy said, what are you doing? You can't do that. <laughs> anyway, we said, here we are, we're doing it. And uh, like that. So from this association with Jai Nand, we became devotees. So me being a practical, mechanically minded person naturally fell in with Jai Nand because he was always doing something, fixing a car. We go out and work, and I just was kind of like Jai Nand's right hand man at that time, and we'd be out working on the carts or you know stuff like that, or going to pick stuff up to bring back for the carts or at the temple preparing some for the Yatra. And Prabhupada came, and like I said, Jayananda's mood was that, what are we going to gain, really, by going to just see Prabhupada? He wanted this service done. So that was better than being in Prabhupada's presence. That was, you know, more satisfying to Prabhupada, and therefore it would be more satisfying to us. And so, you know, we just did that. Jayananda, of course, didn't say that and then run off and go be with Prabhupada. Actually, after Rathiatra, later that day, Jayananda finally went over to go see Prabhupada, and he wasn't there two minutes, and he fell asleep. Prabhupada made some comment, I think, about Jayananda sleeping. Some nice comment, oh, he's worked so hard, and now he's sleeping. People follow imitated Americans. Uh, I, am, I am traveling all over the world. Everywhere I see they are trying to manufacture this skyscraper building, imitating your country. So if you kindly become Krishna conscious and chant and dance in ecstasy, emotional love of God, the whole world will follow you and it will be by Kuntha, there will be no more trouble. Prabhupada went on stage. Vishnu John was uh, on the corner of the stage. Baudak was in front of Prabhupada. Behind Baudak from the crowd, there's a hand sticking up. That's my hand. I was standing there with uh, Vishnu John's mother and Vishnu John's sister. And I had been explaining to his mother, like, what the harmonium is and uh, the madanga, and uh, that how popular and how well-loved Vishnu John was in the movement and how much we appreciated his singing, that he actually was the best. She was very proud of her son. A prophet, after he finished his short lecture, he started to throw the roses from the stage. I was hoping that Vishnu John's mother would catch something and Prabhupada threw the whole bunch of roses and she caught it. When Prabhupada went on the stage at the end of the procession, I also tried to go on the stage, but some person who I didn't know stopped me and said that no women were allowed on the stage. So I tried to reason with him, saying that I was authorized by the BBT trustees and they had paid for my fare and my film. But this person was adamant. So I left the stage and I went to the middle of the field behind the huge assembly of devotees and guests. And I sat down in an empty chair there. And a short time later, I looked up and to my surprise, Srila Prabhupada had gotten up off the Vyasa sun and was raising his arms in the air and beginning to dance. So I immediately climbed on the chair and began to take photographs. And it turned out that I could not have found a better position to be in than that very one where I was. So I'm grateful to this person, who apparently was an obstacle, but in fact was a great help in my service. I actually had a premonition that something amazing is about to happen, and then it did. Prabhupada got up again dancing, jumping up and down, and as he danced and held out his arms, stretched out his arms toward the crowd. He began turning as he danced from side to side in stages. And, and we could see Prabhupada just showering blessings on the people. It was practically visible. There are many pictures, there's many photographs. There are these extraordinarily ecstatic expressions on the faces of the devotees. 
It truly was a mystical spiritual experience. I personally am always more inclined toward philosophy and sort of spiritual logic than just esoteric mystical things. But this was miraculous. It was truly miraculous. You could see Prabhupada showering blessings on the people. Then he left the stage and went back to the temple, and we kept dancing and chanting until the sun went down. Oh, we just we just felt lighter than air. We were just uh, so joyful and so happy to be dancing and chanting with Srila Prabhupada. It was, it was the most uh, wonderful, joyous event. We were out in the crowd serving Pushadam, and there was a kirtan on the stage. There were a lot of people sitting in rows, and we were serving, but there were also a lot of people behind the rows, standing, facing the stage, listening. At a certain point in time, the crowd was chanting, and they became visibly stirred, you know, like roaring. And everybody's hands were up in the air, and all the devotees that were serving the prasad, and we all, Charlie, what's going on? We look at them, and then we turn around and look back at the stage, and Srila Prabhupada was on the stage with his hands up in the air, was jumping up and down big smile on his face. It's like almost like a transference of incredible happiness just shot through the crowd. And everybody simultaneously in that moment became surcharged with uh, mercy, really. Prabhupada's mercy. He just gave everyone mercy. Clearly he was just so happy to see everyone celebrating about the Yantra. This is a Bhagavad Gita dance. Krishna's played by Sarupa, uh, Arjuna by Anasuya, and the sage by Chandavati. And we took 108 principal verses or danceable verses from the Bhagavad Gita, and I narrated it while they performed it uh, using ballet and Bhagavatam to tell the story of the Bhagavad Gita. And Prabhupada saw this in the Los Angeles temple, liked it very much, so we did perform it in India in 1975 and 1977. And he also liked the system of having a narrator speaking and the actors or dancers just acting it out. He said that way you can go any country in the world and just have the narration in whatever language people understand and the performers can act out the dance. He very much encouraged us in this utilizing fine arts for spreading Krishna consciousness. And one morning walk he said, yes, if whoever's an artist let them dance only, let them paint only, let them Whatever their art is, they, they should do that for Krishna. When we heard through the Prabhupada was to be interviewed at a TV station in San Francisco, we tagged along hoping to be able to film him. So we showed up at the TV station and asked the producer if it was all right to set up our 16-millimeter camera and shoot, and he said, why not? He was very obliging. I was surprised, actually. During the interview, you'll hear a thumping sound as Srila Prabhupada is speaking. And that's his hand, uh, as you can see in the visual, uh, going up and down, thumping on the table. Unfortunately, we had placed our microphone right next to his hand. We didn't pick a very good place for the mic. But as we were shooting, we could hear that thumping. And of course, we couldn't really stop the interview. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, you founded the Hare Krishna movement some seven years ago in 1967, did you not? Yes. Uh, in a capsule, what is the movement? Uh, the movement is to have God consciousness of the human being. The uh, human being is distinct, distinguished from the animals, that the animals cannot understand what is God. Mm -hmm. And the human being also uh, does not understand what is God, then he is an animal. I see. And so your movement is to bring about an understanding of God yes. among human beings. Yes. And Hare Krishna means what? Hare Krishna means addressing uh, the energy of God. Pa Hare means the energy of God. And Krishna means God. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you were here yesterday and to attend your annual festival that yeah. was held here in Golden Gate Park, and we were there too. And in fact, here it is. Um, a few thousand people uh, came out to hear it. How many people are now uh, disciples um, 
of the Krishna consciousness movement. Uh, dedicated life, about 10,000. About 10,000 dedicated in ones. In the Western world. Mm -hmm. um, Your Grace, is there any significance in all, at all in the shaved head? Why are heads shaved? We keep ourselves very clean. That's all. Oh, it's just a cleanliness thing? Yes. Is there any significance in the color at, of the at robe? Least, at least uh, at the present moment, people think that uh, by keeping long hair, it becomes very beautiful. I see. Yes. So we are against it. Mm -hmm. Just as simple as that. Is there any significance in the yellow robes? Uh, yellow robe uh, is the dress those who are dedicated. Mm -hmm. uh, that, it, it, it could very well have been a blue robe, but it's oh, just yeah. something that, that was arrived at. This, this um, saffron. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Your Grace, why do you feel that so many people are pulling away from the traditional religions in this country, such as Christianity and so forth, and going uh, for the, uh, trying to understand the Eastern religions? We hear a lot of swamis and gurus and and uh, other type of um, yogi and so forth. Why do you feel that people are pulling away from the traditional Christian standards here? But uh, we, we see that the Christian churches, especially I've seen in London, mostly closed. People are not interested, or the Christian leaders, they cannot make them interested. Why? Did Christianity fail the people, which is why they're turning to other things? Or? I think so. Mm -hmm. You say that Hare Krishna consciousness uh, pretty much takes the absolute truths from the Bible, the Quran, the Torah, and the Vedic. And everywhere. Everywhere. Religion, religion means to understand God. I understand, but do you feel that in, in getting truths from various places like the Bible, the Quran, and so forth, don't you run into conflicts at all or contradictions in those particular philosophies? No, I don't find any conflict because the ultimate goal is God. So you have to understand God and try to love Him. So you can go through any religious process. If the goal is attained, that you understand what is God and you try to love Him, then your life is perfect. Why do we see so many of your followers chanting um, yeah. almost all the time? Chanting means to keep association with God always. So you have to audibly chant yes. Hare Krishna? Yes. This is This is... Uh, transcendental, transcendental vibration, just like uh, radio message. If you keep contact with the radio message, uh, then you know everything what is going on outside. Similarly, this transcendental sound, Hare Krishna, if you chant, then you keep connection with God directly. Thank you very much, um, Your Divine Grace. It's been our privilege to, to talk with you and to meet you. Thank you. And hope that we can see you again when you return. We'll be back with more news in just a moment. because there were three palaquins instead of what we previously had, one large chariot. There was some problem in the 1973 Rathiatra with health and safety. So we had these three palaquins, which in one sense it was a little disappointing because 1973 Rathiatra was such an exceptional occurrence because Srila Prabhupada had, had come to that Rathiatra and he danced all the way from Marble Arch down Park Avenue right down to Trafalgar Square. And I'm talking dancing here, arms raised, jumping up and down. To watch Prophet doing that was just the most amazing spectacle you could ever see. It was truly wonderful. So 1974 wasn't quite of that caliber in that we didn't have the large cart. We had the three palaquins which were carried shoulder height and Srila Prabhupada wasn't there. But it was very ecstatic 
because it was Rathiatra and Lord Jagannath was out wandering in the streets of London, we took the same route so we could remember when Prabhupada was with us, which was really nice. And of course the Kirtan was ecstatic. You can see in the video Rubatinanda and Swami is leading some fantastic Kirtan as he'd been doing in the 73 one when Prabhupada was dancing. So in that way, some really wonderful memories. That's me in the blue sari with the yellow cardigan, just to prove I was there. And look, hair beautifully tied back. I've had the same hairstyle for almost 40 years now because that's what Prabhupada wanted and that's what we've done. We've always tried to do what Prabhupada wanted.
And I have to admit, too, I remember feeling like a little surprised, like how come these people that just got this wonderful exchange with Prabhupada didn't immediately just run to the temple and follow us and shave up or put on a sari or anything. We were in Dallas and uh, there's a traveling sack at time. We'd come all the way down from Montreal. It was probably just after Mardi Gras. We went out to the airport. We missed Prabhupada when he arrived. It was about time we got to the temple. There was a group which was going on. And uh, up until then, I'd never seen Prabhupada in person. And that was after six years of being involved in Krishna consciousness. I saw Prabhupada. I just related to this moving picture of Prabhupada. You know, like Prabhupada. The picture who was moving. And uh, that was my impression at that time that Prabhupada was actually not different than this picture. There was a discussion. Prabhupada was talking about Vedanta. And he was saying that the Mayavadis couldn't understand Vedanta. And then he began to question us why couldn't they understand? He was specifically mentioning Ram Krishna and other famous uh, Mayavadis. He said, why couldn't he understand? And so then uh, Brahmananda replied, Nahan Prakasha Sarvasya Yoga Maya, that first from Bhagavad Gita. And Prabhupada wasn't satisfied with that answer. And then someone else gave another answer, but he wasn't satisfied with that either. Then finally, Dhyananda sat bolt upright and he said, they cannot understand because they haven't got Bhakti Vedanta. So Prabhupada smiled and said, here is the answer. And it was such a nice answer on two levels. One, that they didn't have Prabhupada. And on the other level, they didn't have any Bhakti. So how could they understand the end of truth? So Prabhupada was really happy with that answer. And I remember I kind of felt like all of us were slightly envious that Dainan had come up with this fabulous answer. <laughs> Molly Murdoch came with his wife and uh, Prabhupada in private made some comments why you've given up sannyas for uh, you know this particular lady because she wasn't who she had been said to be and she wasn't all that attractive but Prabhupada received them very nicely and he was just so encouraging I thought that was very very instructive huh? somebody had some difficulty but Srila Prabhupada never forgot the service that they had rendered and his love for those who surrendered their lives to him and, and helped him certainly these special souls that helped him extensively in the early days you know his gratitude was was boundless and, uh, as we heard later on in the eighth canto that one may have difficulty in one ashram Ashram wasn't the main thing. Wherever one would find strength, one should situate oneself in those circumstances so that one could continue in one's Krishna consciousness. The Dallas Himbo was quite involved in um, studying Bhagavad Gita. And we would have a verse for the day, and that would be chanted before every part of the morning program. It would be chanted before the prasadam prayer. As a group, we would recite the verse, and the idea is that by the end of the day, pretty much you knew the verse. And in this way, we're quickly learning entire chapters of Bhagavad Gita. So we were quite proud of ourselves. And there used to be a, a prize if you could chant an entire chapter of Bhagavad Gita without making so many mistakes, you would get a maha plate. And that was a really big deal. So um, when Shiloh Prabhupada came, we were very proud of our accomplishments. So we brought the entire temple in and all the children. And we started the recitation of Bhagavad Gita from chapter 1, verse 1. And I think by that time we could get through 10, 12 chapters in unison as a temple. It was a very ecstatic feeling to be chanting like that. But at the end, Prabhupada just stopped us cold and he pointed to one of the children and said, So, what does this particular verse mean? <laughs> and of course, we were not so expert in being able to give the meaning for the verse. And Prabhupada stressed upon us that it, as nice as it was that we were chanting the Bhagavad Gita in Sanskrit, it would actually be more important to know the meaning. Because I had some educational background, I was sent to Dallas. I had the unique situation of being drop-loaded as a new devotee into a situation as a teacher. So while I was taking care of the children, 
they actually taught me Krishna consciousness. They were my bhakti leaders. Their Krishna consciousness was completely genuine. So those principles that I learned from them, like full dependence on Krishna and turning to Krishna at every moment, are what has kept me in service to Srila Prabhupada's movement all these years. Well, I believe this is the first school, isn't it, in the United States to be established? Uh, why was Dallas particularly chosen for for the school? Uh, is that Krishna's Dallas? choice. Krishna's choice. Yeah. He chose uh, chose Dallas. Yes, we got a nice house, and he accepted. So it was Krishna's choice. Where does the Krishna National or the International Krishna Organization get its funds from? Simply donations. They've been criticized occasionally for being very wealthy. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is our reputation. Uh, if in Indian parliament this question was raised, that these Hare Krishna people fabulously rich, where they get money. Somebody suspected we are getting bribes from American government. <laughs> <laughs> the Krishna religion teaches that women are to be subservient to men always. Why? Uh, the Krishna religion teaches that women should be subservient, should be subordinate to men. He's asking why. Well, uh, not should be, they are, by nature. It seemed that Prabhupada uh, enjoyed creating some controversy where uh, the media would pick up on that controversy because he knew that the uh, media thrived on controversy. So I think he was using the men 64 ounce brain capacity and the women uh, 36 ounce brain capacity as a way to kind of playfully stir up some uh, controversy about the Hare Krishna movement and then he knew that people would be talking about it and it was a way that Prabhupada, just like you know, an uncle um, might tease the children of his son and um, pinch them or make fun of them. I think Prabhupada often played the role of the elderly uncle kind of making fun or teasing in various situations. But ultimately, uh, before Prabhupada left Chicago, he did tell the devotees that the women who joined this movement are just as intelligent as the men are. One of Prabhupada's lectures there at the temple, uh, someone asked, what is it like to be in the position you're in? It seemed like the question was addressed, you know, what is it like to be the guru? What is it like to be in your exalted position of so many people worshipping you and so forth? He just said, I am never afraid. That was amazing. You could have heard a pin drop for about 30 seconds there. It was just completely quiet. So we greeted his car there. It's a very short distance from the curb of the street to the temple, but we greeted him throwing flowers. And, and then he went into the temple and offered his respects to Radhakala Chanti. And if he spent any time in the temple at all, it was, he hardly said anything. Very short. Glad to be here. Glad to see the children again. And he went up into his room where he's passing out Ras Gulas. Everyone's sort of dispersing and going back to their respective places, the classroom or the... I was taking my son home, and um, all of a sudden one of Prabhupada's servants came running through the building saying, Prabhupada wants to see all the children. It was such a terrific surprise. And, you know, the mothers got their babies. He said, everybody, all the children. Because at first we were thinking it was just the school children. And we all came up, and he said, Prabhupada has rescuers for all the children. And so everyone started lining up, and Prabhupada gave a rasgula to each child. The kids, all they've seen is pictures of Prabhupada. They've heard stories of Prabhupada. They learned the obeisances to Prabhupada. But here he was. And they were just awestruck. And my heart was so filled, because having a child, I knew how he's reaching them on such a personal level. And he even asked for the babies. And Jagadish, he would say something about each child. Prabhupada, this is so-and-so, and he would say a thing about him. When I brought Ishwarpuri up, he said, this is Ishwarpuri. 
He's Mandaleshwar's son. He's a rascal. And Prabhupada just laughed. And then he gave him the rasgula. Then he dropped it. I picked it up and gave it back to him. And years later, we saw this footage. And Ish told me, he said, when I dropped that rasgula, you picked it up for me. That's been the story of my life. I'm dropping Krishna consciousness and you're always picking it up and giving it back to me. I specifically remember a meeting in which some of the teachers uh, asked Prabhupada's advice about teaching. And um, at that time I seem to remember there were kind of two camps. One camp really wanted to to be very loving to the students. They, They somehow wanted to control the students through affection or through love. And then another camp teachers wanted to be very strict with the students and I remember very clearly that Prabhupada said that we needed to communicate affection to the students I can't remember the precise words that Prabhupada used but I remember very clearly uh, getting the message from Prabhupada that the teacher needs to have real affection for the student and he needs to be able to communicate that affection to the student. Otherwise, how will the student take what the teacher is is giving? There may certainly be discipline, but this real affection coming from the teacher to the student has to be there. The other thing that happened before I arrived there was that Prabhupada had visited uh, a couple of years prior to this visit, and uh, he wrote a letter in which he said, if the students are beaten or if the stick is used on the students, he said, I'll use the stick on the teacher. So my understanding of that was always that uh, the teachers should not consider themselves the highest authority and they shouldn't misuse their position as teachers and they, they should always be mindful of the fact that they're answerable to a higher authority and, and that whatever they administer to the students that they certainly will uh, have to either enjoy or suffer themselves in the future. Also, what's prominent in my mind is that Prabhupada always loved children. He just, before, during, and after my Gurukula experience, I always remember Prabhupada being very affectionate to children and to, to anyone who was in the dependent situation. I was, you know, recognized as being something of a um, hyperactive, um, a little bit out of control, difficult to deal with kid. My first remembrance of Prabhupada was the wave of utter, absolute thrill and excitement that I experienced seeing him, which even as a boy took me by surprise. And when Prabhupada came around, it really transformed me. You know, you took one glance at Prabhupada and you were there. And you could step right into it. It was more than tangible. You ate it, you know. It was, and it would last about as long as I was, you know, in Prabhupada's company. After about an hour, I'd start losing it and start acting, you know, seven or eight years old again. You know, it, it really seemed everyone was very harsh in comparison to what Prabhupada was about. So as soon as Prabhupada would come, then it's like we would get nice clothes and we'd get new bedding and the prashadam was like really good. And, the harshness and the discipline went way down, and, you know, which is sort of like the opposite of if you have a military superior officer coming through, then what happens is like, you know, the discipline gets more and more severe and strict. And here it just seemed to happen that when Prabhupada came around, um, people lightened up a little bit. They seemed to become a little bit more blissful and respectful and, and uh, sweet. I remember being in uh, New Vrindavan with Prabhupada the first time. I must have been two or three years old. And uh, the deities would open. We'd be standing in front of Vrindavan Chandra. And I would be dancing and holding Prabhupada's hand. And you zone in on small little details. And the detail I remember was holding his hand. And I would stop dancing because I'd start rubbing in the palm of his hand it was so soft. The softness of Prabhupada's hand reminds me of the way that I feel about Prabhupada. 
And after a while, he'd let go of my hand and he'd sort of motion for me to dance and jump up and down and smiling and making me jump higher and more and more. Um, after the kirtans, um, Prabhupada would go and sit down on his Vyasa son and uh, everyone was sitting and listening to class and, and I'd run out to the garden and pick a flower and run back in and pay obeisances in front of Prabhupada and hand it to him. Pay obeisances, run back out, pick a flower, run back in, pay obeisances. I just kept doing this all through the class and Prabhupada never said anything. You know, for me, I didn't have that fear of Prabhupada. You could tell that he would let you come close to him and hold his hand and he'd encourage you to dance. Then when I got older, I was in Dallas, Gurukula, and I must have been five, maybe six, and Jagadish Maharaj would be standing there introducing each of us as we walked in the room, what our name was, who our parents were, what temple we were from, and Prabhupada would give us a, a rascula, a sweet. I remember for some reason, we went through quite quickly, but there was a couple of children where Prabhupada would ask more questions about them. And by that time, I had learned that Prabhupada was someone really special, and I was nervous. And they were asking questions about me when I was there, and I was like, hurry up, hurry up. <laughs> this is making me nervous. And so I came back from Dallas Gurukula to New Vrindavan in uh, 1976. And that was the uh, last year that I saw Prabhupada. I didn't go down and hold his hands at that age, and I didn't go down and offer flowers like I did when I was small. And I used to sing in a temple, and at one point Prabhupada had asked me to sing. And I came inside the room and I sang the first verse of Samsara Dava. And he said, keep singing. Some other people came in and started talking, but I, I left the room. My mother had always wanted me to sing. It just came up later on that I liked singing, but Prabhupada had asked me to keep singing that day that I went into his room. I paid my obeisances, and Tulananda was there. He gave me Prabhupada's garland. So I was, like, really nervous, and as soon as I got up, I looked at Srila Prabhupada, who was sitting behind his desk, and um, the first thing he said, so you were Henry Ford's great-grandson? And I said, yes, Srila Prabhupada. And then he said to me in a very grave voice, he said, so where is he now? <laughs> and, uh, so I was a little stunned. <laughs> My immediate reaction was, well, he's dead. But then I was thinking that this wasn't really what Prabhupada was talking about. He was saying, where is his soul now? Which I didn't have a really good answer for. So then Prabhupada spoke for a little while, and he was saying something along the line that Henry Ford was such a famous man. He said, now you should become just as famous for being a devotee. There was a teacher who I had been cultivating. He was teaching in the public school, and he had won the award for being the best teacher in the county, and he was interested in Krishna consciousness. But he had somewhat of a disaster in his life because he had doubled as a bus driver. And on Valentine's Day, one of the children, he let off the bus and crawled under the bus to retrieve a valentine. And he had run over this child and killed it, not knowing the child was there. So he wanted to meet Prabhupada, but at the same time he was in distress. So I asked Prabhupada if he could see him, and he said, yes, bring him this evening at 7. And so I explained to Prabhupada that he had this concern because he was being sued by the parents. And so Prabhupada began to ask him so many questions you know, to get all the details of the story. And I was kind of surprised. Did you have insurance? Did you look both ways? I mean, he was asking, almost like a, like his attorney, asking him all the particulars of the case. And then after he heard everything, Prabhupada said, it's all right, no court of law will be responsible for this. You did everything you were supposed to do. And then this boy was completely relieved. It was then that Prabhupada actually began to seriously preach to him. And he began to tell us the story about Werner von Braun, the, you know, the V-2 rocket scientist from Germany that had come over to help develop the missile program in this country. And apparently Werner von Braun and an assembly of scientists had stated that he thought the whole purpose of science is to prove the existence of God. 
So Prabhupada was making arrangements that uh, some devotees would bring him copies of his books. So then he began to explain how the universe was like a machine and that, that God was ultimately the, the driver of the machine. So then I got excited. I said, Prabhupada, this is wonderful. I said, he's such a famous person. If he becomes a devotee, then and he cut me off. He said, we're not interested in speaking to him because he's a famous person. He said, we are interested in speaking to him because he's come to the right point. He said, that is our interest. So he immediately corrected me that he wasn't cultivating the man because he was famous or that he could do something for us, but rather because he had actually come to this serious point of inquiry. One time when we had a big ceremony in the temple, the little girls that you see here, I had many of them, over 20, and they all had to behave properly and it was a bit of a chore to do it and one of them started crying and I actually had to take her out of the temple and put her in a classroom and then later after Srila Prabhupada finished his program in the temple room he was headed to his own quarters and usually he went directly to his quarters but instead he stopped in front of one classroom the classroom that I put the child in and there was no way that he could see through the door to see that there was anyone in the classroom. It was a solid door, but he opened that door particularly. And when he opened it, it bumped right into the child who had fallen asleep in back of the door. And then she quickly got up and paid her obeisances. And I'll just never forget that compassionate look on his face, seeing this child's tear-streaked face and frumpled clothing from laying on the floor. And she sat up with her hands folded and he touched her head. and. That one gesture of Shola Prabhupada giving love to this child who I'd had to have removed because of her behavior taught me more than anything because Shola Prabhupada was so warm and so personal that I realized that if I'm following in his footsteps, I'd better at least try to become a little like that myself. There was a garden off to the side of the temple that had been made quite a nice place, a little fountain and a lot of Tulsi plants. And He used to have evening darshans out there and, and the devotees would read from Krishna book. And at one point, Brahmananda was reading from the Krishna book, The Kidnapping of Rukmini. And in the middle of the story, in the part where Krishna actually grabs Rukmini and makes off with her, Prabhupada suddenly sat upright. His eyes got very big. He said, yes. And as they were driving away, he said, she was driving the chariot. He made like this gesture, like holding the reins. She was driving the chariot, not that she was just some weak woman, not able to do anything. She was actually driving the chariot. Because he got so excited about that, I went and looked it up in the Krishna book to see if there were any details like that, but there weren't any. So apparently he had some kind of inside track in this particular pastime. Prabhupada chanting in the temple room in front of Radha Kalachanji. I'll never forget this. Prabhupada got into chanting the Mahamantra over and over and over, and the devotees absolutely went wild. It didn't start off wild. It started off just normal chanting. We were all sitting down. But it just got to a point where it was building up to such a fervor. Everyone was like running back and forth between Radha Kalachandra and Prabhupada at the other end because it's a big temple room. We went back and forth and it just seemed like it went on for an ecstatic eternity. And then at one point I stopped and looked at Prabhupada chanting sort of over the side so I wouldn't get, you know, trampled <laughs> because it was, it was a rather uh, wild group. But I remember looking at Prabhupada and I said, this is the whole reason he has come, simply to chant the holy names. I just have this picture in my mind of Prabhupada chanting. I'd like to die with that picture.
out of this open field. And as soon as he stepped out of the woods and out of the field, he stopped and looked at the devotees. And he had a, a serious concern in his countenance. And he asked, why are these fields fallow? And why aren't there any men working in these fields? And where's the oxen? And that really impressed me. I, I was the only one farming at that time. I didn't say anything. But it really touched me that Prabhupada was you know, attentive to what was being done in the agricultural realm. He had an awareness of the importance of an agrarian culture, not just for the sake of you know having your own food if and when the economy fails and all that, but for the sake of, as he explains, you know, living off nature's gifts as a matter of relationships, where everything and everyone is you know, assisting everyone and everything else in serving Krishna. And that kind of spirit fosters an appreciation for everyone and everything, which also fosters more appreciation of the designer of this whole perfect arrangement. And also, you know, seeing food is more than food, is more than water, but sacraments. I've been doing farm work and conservation work all my life, and I'd seen the plight of the American farmer from 1950 on. I saw the introduction of tractors and, and how they displaced the draft animals, from which came overproduction of food, from which came um, the government paying the farmers more for not growing than they get for the crops from the farms all going under, being bought up by the big exploitive farmers. So I saw this whole syndrome. And then I saw by this concern, and it wasn't just a question, there was a, you could see in his face, a serious concern that this would befall the devotees in New Vrindavan. Because he was aware of this whole tendency and syndrome. You know, his, his terminology, like, you know, defining the tractor as the killer of the bull. If, if you're not seeing yourself as dependent on the land, dependent on the oxen, and you're, you're not going to have the proper appreciation, you're not going to have cow protection on, on the level of what he defined as, you know, the cows are jolly. They're not jolly unless they're contributing to society. So seeing these, you know, these things that Prabhupada would pick up on gave me such an appreciation of the depth of his wisdom and the integrity of his understanding of all aspects of spiritual life. In the summer of 73 is when they started work on Srila Prabhupada's palace. I came in uh, August. Right away I, I started working up at the palace. So when Prabhupada came in 74, you know, there had been correspondence you know, with Kirtananda Maharaj and Srila Prabhupada about the palace. And Prabhupada kept on saying he was very anxious to come see the palace. And uh, me and my god brother, Ghost of Ihari, we were the only two people that were working on the palace at that time. It was uh, just some concrete blocks. There was no roof. It was mostly just a mud floor. I think they had just started to lay marble in one room, and they only had like two pieces of marble down. And, and the rest, it was just, you know, a construction site. Nothing at all, really, to look at. And um, Prabhupada, he got out of the car, and I remember he had a big smile on his face. And Kirtan Ananda Maharaj was showing him around the palace, and saying this is where the you know the deity room will be and from your study you'll be able to look at the deities and this will be your bedroom and your bathroom and and Prabhupada was just smiling beaming and uh, he was taking his cane and, and poking it in the walls and he poked the door jam you know making sure things were, were solid and there was a pile of cement that just had some plastic over it and Prabhupada said you know you should cover this better me and Ghost of Bihari were there. We thought, well, why did he say that? It's perfectly covered with plastic. And it wasn't until like a week after Prabhupada had left that when we opened it up, when it had rained, some water had gotten in and ruined some of the bags. Uh, Prabhupada was so alert, he'd notice things like that. And then Bali Mardan Prabhu said, Srila Prabhupada, in the Krishna book, it says that Krishna's palace was illuminated with the jewels on the wall and Prabhupada lifted his cane up and waved it towards the devotees. 
And he said, these devotees are my jewels. I rejoined Prabhupada in New Vrindavan in 1974. I was away for six months. That's when I had gotten married, so now I was a grahasta. This one day, the secretary starts reading this letter, and it's from one of Prabhupada's disciples, and he's the temple president, and he's married. And in the letter, he asked Prabhupada if it's okay if he gets a divorce and remarries. In the same paragraph, he asked this question. So I'm just rubbing Prabhupada's back and listening. And Prabhupada gave his permission. He said, yes, that's okay. So as soon as he said it, I just couldn't understand how Prabhupada had given that answer. I had been with him for a long time, listened to so many classes, Prabhupada speaking about Vedic society and marriage and uh, no divorce. And when he said that, I just became I guess confused. Of course, I didn't say anything. It wasn't my position to speak. And I, I knew Prabhupada, what he said was correct, but I didn't understand it. It was probably the only time where I felt like that. I just didn't understand Prabhupada's answer. And every evening, I would give Prabhupada massage as well. So that evening, I was actually well, in trouble a spot. that I... I just thought I'm going to say something. I have to ask Prabhupada why he had said that. And I was at the foot of his bed, and I was rubbing his legs and rubbing his feet. And Prabhupada is lying down in bed. It's so peaceful, which is a little troublesome because you don't want to say anything. But it was bothering me that much that I did. So finally, Prabhupada, you remember during massage today that devotee sent a letter and he asked you if it was okay to get a divorce. And I, I couldn't even say it, get remarried. And as soon as I said it, get a divorce, Prabhupada said, yes. I told him it was all right. <laughs> I said, yes, Prabhupada, that's, that's why I'm asking. Because you always say that no divorce, there's no question of divorce. Once one is married, they stay together but you told him it was okay. And Prabhupada said, yes, in your country these things are going on, very common. And again, I had thought a lot about you know, what I wanted to say to him. So as soon as he said that, I, well, I said, yes, but also in our country, meat eating is common, and intoxication is common. I said, but these things are all forbidden for us. And then he changed his tone and he became more serious. Yes, he said, if I tell him no, still he's going to get a divorce and get remarried. So if I tell him yes, then the offense is not so great. 